Hello, everyone. Welcome to Talking Leadership. This is Eric Perez welcoming you back to our ongoing series of podcasts. And today I have the great honor to be joined by two entrepreneurs, not the one. So I would look forward to these conversations in a big, bad way. And uh, I'm building up the content around those in, in the entrepreneurial space. So I hope you enjoy today's podcast. Both of today's guests are entrepreneurs in their own right, and they're the co-founders of Tenacious Ventures. Can I welcome to the podcast, Sarah Nolet and Matthew Pryor. How are you guys? Hey, good. Thanks, Sarah. Yeah, thanks for having us. So thank you for, for coming along. I know it's, it's busy in this new COVID world. Uh, let, let, me, let me go to where I start this podcast by asking, and I'll start with you, Sarah, if I could. What was your pathway to becoming an entrepreneur in, in 100 words or less? Yeah, it's, it, it's probably a tough one to be so short on. I mean, if I'm really honest, I kind of fell into it. I, when I left grad school and moved to Australia, I thought about what made me tick and what I wanted to do in the world and what were opportunities that were created in a new country. And one of the big ones was solving important problems that would have an impact, especially on the environment. And the second was working with world-class people, uh, having an impact on the world and innovating in, in exciting ways. And that led me to the intersection of entrepreneurship, technology, and agriculture. And the best way to get started was to start a business. And so that led me to create Agthentic, which is a consulting and advisory company. So I would say it was led by kind of values and priorities in terms of what I, what the change I wanted to see in the world and the things I was prioritizing in my career, which was working with people um, who had aligned values. Matthew, over to you. Yeah, I think I'm, my answer is probably a little bit more self, uh, like self-reflective in terms of I think right from very early age, uh, my dad always said to me, you know, that, that you should work for yourself. Uh, I, I started my first company that was a very failed T-shirt printing enterprise when I was 16. And so I think it was, it was largely that. It was, it was largely that I wanted to be in control of my own destiny. I, I'm not sure it was great advice, actually. I think uh, I ended up having to learn a lot of stuff by first principles that would have been easier uh, learn inside somebody else's enterprise, but there you have it. I, I, I started a co- co-founder company straight out of university with a couple of mates out of uni, and then uh, you know that was that went for about ten years, and then started another company um, after taking a year off, and that went for about ten years. So I think you know in my entire working life, I, I believe I've been an employee for a company I wasn't a shareholder in for maybe three of of, of close to thirty years. I'll ask you both this this question. It's about the thing that that makes up the the kind of person that that becomes an entrepreneur and and Matthew you touched on it so I'll start with you if I can degree of control as an entrepreneur is that something that drives you to work in that space that you want to have a sense of control over the thing that you're um the the goal that you're working to or the outcome that you're working to I think that is part of it but I'm not sure which comes first whether it's the belief or the, the 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 desire for that self determination the determination I, I think partly if you believe something that most people don't believe then the main choice that you have is to go off and try it yourself right and that that's one of the key characteristics and I think you know to to, to Sarah's example more you know where, where it's really about having an impact or in my case it was in particular that I just you know wanted to pursue ideas and and those ideas were mine and you know at least several of them were very bad ideas uh so you know that that's the choice that you have so i think it's perhaps not one single thing but if you you know in the venn diagram of people who are entrepreneurs then there's a lot of intersection around that yes belief in a thing that they want to see real and that desire to largely march to the beat of their own drum rather than somebody else's. Sarah, I'll put that question to you. Was it about a, a degree of control or, and I don't mean control in a negative way, but just to be able to steer the ship of state in the way that you see fit as opposed to having someone else put that upon you or is it to achieve uh, the outcome? And you said, and I know it's a big term, changing the world or at least a small chunk of that world that we live on. So what, 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 what been, what's been what been the driver for you? Yeah, the thing that resonates there with with me and my story is that aspect of self-determination and belief that you want something to exist. And for me, it was, you know, wanting to wake up and and being willing to wake up every 
day and kind of fight and work for something to exist in the world. Uh, and in that case, it was bringing more useful technologies to agriculture and the best way I could figure out how to do that kept being my own way through different projects and opportunities I was coming across. And so, yeah, wanting to be able to solve the problem in the ways I was finding were the best ones and um, wake up every day kind of fighting for something and working that hard. You also want to own a bit of piece of a piece of the upside, if not all of it, um, if you're going to work that hard and fight that hard. Um, so I don't know if it's control or self-determination or some combination, um, but, but all those kind of come together. Okay, so I'll, I'll ask, um, I'll throw to this in terms of um, your, your pathway to becoming entrepreneurs, and this is very much linked to a topic that comes up quite a lot, at least on, on the podcast that I'm putting together, is this issue of mentoring. So I'll start with you, Sarah. Did you have someone that served as a template or, or individual family member or someone that um, got you down that pathway? Or is, is mentoring not a feature of your coming up as an entrepreneur? Yeah, for sure. I, I did. And you know, started with both of my parents who ha have been entrepreneurs um, in, in various ways. My mom you know, started a hair scrunchie business. And I, I literally remember sitting around the table, you know, making different uh, bow ties and hair ties and, and things. Um, and just that, you know, kind of work ethic and figure it out and find a way um, belief. And, and my dad was involved in the semiconductor industry and, you know, conversations. Uh, my parents were divorced. And so I ended up one on one with both parents a lot and if they're starting a business that's kind of what's on their mind all the time and if all they've got to talk to is a six-year-old they're going to talk about business probably and so um, a lot of my childhood was talking about business but I think just being in that environment gets you conditioned to it and different ways of thinking and solving those problems and kind of living and breathing business for sure has had an impact uh, and both my parents have been mentors uh, along the way. So maybe less in the formal sense of asking someone to be a mentor and more in the kind of living and breathing it uh, for many years. Matthew, same question to you. And, and I guess in, in remembering the start of the podcast, you mentioned that your dad suggested you should work for yourself. Were there other people in, in your life that suggested do this as a way to make an income? Or did they say, don't be crazy, go work for someone else and, and and leave all that pain sort of to one side? Yeah, I mean, short answer is no. And, and when I reflect back on my early career, I think that that was a big mistake. I think also it was the case, so as kind of entrepreneurs, I remember we had to subscribe to a printed newsletter out of Silicon Valley to kind of get access to the sort of stuff that's common now. So. It, it also wasn't as much a thing, and I, I think that was much to our detriment as, as young founders, that there just wasn't a community you, you could tap into. I mean, there, was, there were business people who I was surrounded with who were successful, um, but I, th I think we just didn't, you know, didn't have the culture then of really uh, yeah, mentoring in, in the sense that it's, it's so well understood now. And, uh, you know, I... I think me coming up as a person who knew how to run a business properly, you know, took an awful lot longer as a, as a consequence. We, we made plenty of mistakes because it was three, we were 22 a piece, um, you know, running a decently sized business. And half the time we didn't have any clue what we were doing and we would have benefited greatly from, uh, you know, from some from good mentoring. Asking the question around mentoring is not a value judgment on my part uh, at all. It's more asking were there some, um, people in your li lives that help you guide to guide you to where you are. So um, taking that one step further as you've, and, and I'm sure you've both associated with other entrepreneurs as time has gone on, do you learn from your competitors? Do you learn from other entrepreneurs or is it more on the job? It's, it's hard to learn from someone else when it's your business. So you've got to take the, um, the knocks and the bumps and the, and the lumps and so to speak in the business. And that's, the greatest teacher or can someone else provide you a little nugget of gold that will help you in, in your work? And I'll, I'll put that to Sarah first. And for those listening, they're both, both my guests are smiling at me thinking of something here. So, so we're going to get some good responses here. So I'll go with Sarah first. 
If I have a superpower, it's asking questions or not be able to, not be afraid to ask for help. And so um, being, and maybe it's, you know, I grew up in Silicon Valley and that culture of asking for and help and having access to people who've gone in before you and, and done it before is something I, I grew up with. So yes, you can get those nuggets from others, whether you listen to those nuggets or want to learn the lessons yourself is, is probably a different question. And in my journey, it's definitely come down to both. I've, I've taken the advice and been happy about it and I've rejected the advice and definitely been happy and unhappy about it. So, um, you know, a combination, I would say, of learning the hard way or, or by going through it and yet others can save you tons of trouble um, having been there before and that culture of not being afraid to ask for help or get that advice, it can save a lot of pain for sure. Same question as before, Matthew. Um, what, what's your view on, um, on seeking help, I guess, as an entrepreneur or learning from others in your space? Well, actually, I, I'm listening to an audio book at the moment and, and it was described this way, which I think is perfect, that a smart person learns from their mistakes, a wise person learns from other people's mistakes. And uh, I think that that was, I, I'm a lot smarter than I am wise, sadly. Um, but I, you know, to answer another part of the question that you asked, I mean, now today with the running the venture capital side of the business, we spend a lot of time with founders and I, I learn from founders all the time because you just constantly are exposed to kind of different ways of looking at things you, you, Eric, before when you were talking about that kind of idea of it's seeking help and not a value judgment and all that kind of stuff and, and whilst that's true I think you know what we also want to be true and, and what I've had to work very hard on for myself is finding the right way to be both sort of you know have a growth mindset but also be self-aware enough to know where you need to grow, right? It's yeah. So I think I think those two things in combination of of being being open to the feedback as well as understanding that you're going to have to do work to improve, and you know, ideally, benefiting from stuff that other 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 people have done is a shorter path to to get there as well. So um, and and I appreciate that response, and it, you both helped me set up the next theme, and and this is one again not. Not to be negative, but I've got to ask this if, if, if this podcast is going to be of any value, is talking about the most difficult elements of being an entrepreneur. Now, I've had a lot of different responses to this, and I'm sure you guys are going to add another unique perspective again. So I'll, I'll start with Sarah. What, what do you find is, is the most difficult part about, about being an entrepreneur? It's different things at, at different times, but one of the big ones that we that I've experienced and we see a lot with founders we now work with is the kind of loneliness in the decision making. And I know when I first started Agthentic and it was on my mind all the time, what to do, how to do it, and you just don't have anyone else in the world who cares even half as much as you do about the outcome of the decision. And you know, it's really different when you have a co-founder, a business partner to bounce those decisions off of and, and make them together. No less responsibility to come to the you know same rigor of, of conclusion. But when you're in it alone, um, it can be really tough and really lonely just to feel like no one else cares even close to as much as you do uh, about decisions, you know, even little ones, but especially big ones. Okay, that, that's brilliant. Thank you for your candor on that. Uh, Matthew? Yeah, I, I think it's similar. I mean, I, I think the sense of kind of, um, yeah, solitude and, and responsibility, I think, especially as you start to grow and people join you on the mission because of the story that you told them, then all of a sudden the, the sense of responsibility becomes, you know, inordinately larger and, and you can't help but absorb that responsibility, not just for getting to where you said that you would go, but, but being responsible for everybody else's expectations about the company delivering on the vision as well. And, and that's sometimes one of the difficulties of being an entrepreneur is sometimes it's very hard to tell how close to success you are. And sometimes when you are, in fact, very close to success, you, you can't tell that you're any closer than you were a year ago. And so you kind of carry all of this hope and expectation um, and, and you know sometimes that you kind of break through the barrier and you're there but sometimes you are actually very close to succeeding but just feel like you're failing all the time and it can be you know it can be a big burden to carry do you find that with your the businesses that you started sometimes it's hard to let go to be to not be the parent in the business and let someone else come in and help 
run the business and make some decisions. It's not all about you. So uh, letting go is where I'm going with this. Is that do you find that difficult in the businesses that you've you've operated now or previously? I, I might go to Sarah with that as a first point of call. Did have you found a, a difficulty there? Yeah, and it goes to maybe a, a point about kind of leadership versus entrepreneurship and and your kind of philosophy around leadership and how do you empower people on your team to own outcomes and feel like and be business owners but know that at the end of the day they might not be you know if they're if they're not a significant owner they they might not be a a full you know they're not gonna wake up living and breathing the company in the same way that you are and and finding the right balance um, can definitely be a tough thing Um, you know that's different than bringing on a business partner or a co-founder, uh, which really is, is sharing the load. And, and, you know, the kind of litmus test there is, could you go out of town, you know, leave and, and truly they could run the business without you. And, and that's um, a, a very different kind of, you know, control or partnership um, dynamics there. So both challenging in, in different ways, uh, but like anything, business is a people game. And so f- making sure the people you bring into your business and then onto your team have that alignment and you've you've thought about their responsibilities and what control you're going to give up and what ownership they're going to have it's just about relationships like anything else it doesn't mean it's easy all the time but I, I think it's um it's a challenge that comes through your leadership philosophy and not yeah probably no easy answers there no and that's okay I mean I wish personally more people would have that mindset it's quite nice to hear hear from someone in, in the space that you play in that it's a people game not a game about things and that makes a difference because sometimes um and and I've, I've seen this in my own travels again not not i won't ever mention a name here but I've, I've seen some people that treat their staff and their their colleagues like dirt and still get the outcomes they want because unfortunately uh, some people need need employment. And they need to be in a job, and they'll, some people are prepared to wear um, certain degrees of abuse to get a job or keep an income coming in, and that's unfortunate. But yeah, it's good, it is good to hear that um, uh, there are people out there that view this as a people game, and that's a necessarily a good thing because then you treat people like human beings, you get a better outcome than if you don't. So Matthew, same same question as as. Um, as I put to Sarah, what, what, what's your view there, mate? I think one of the other challenges is as an entrepreneur and especially in the early journey, you have to be able to do everything, right? So you come up and you're doing the books and you're doing the sales and you're building the product. And, and to some extent, your identity gets defined by the fact that you are doing everything and you can do everything. And I think that's one of the things that actually gets in the way of that perspective Sarah was talking about, which is ultimately realizing that, at, you know, there's a transition over a period of time where you have to step away from being the doer and your job becomes it making sure that the people you bring into the business can do and, and your job is actually in service to them. And I think that's, yeah, again, to that kind of question of the difference between entrepreneurialism and, and leadership um, and that sense that, you know, increasingly as the job becomes being a leader, then your job is in service of the other people that you brought into business to make sure that they can do what they were brought in to do well because there's more than needs to be done, you know, than, than any one or even small number of people can do. So, you know, you kind of get to the level where you can afford to employ people. Now you've got to make sure that they can do the best that they can possibly do. Do you believe that entrepreneurs are necessarily more tenacious in in what they're chasing within their business or the issues that they're trying to resolve. So roadblocks become uh, something that drives you more than someone who's in a straight leadership role that may not have an investment, a financial stake in the business. I I might start with Matthew on that one. Do do you believe that there's there's more of a a get in and, and completely tackle the problem because as an entrepreneur, this is one of the things that drives you is to find solutions to those problems as they come up? I think the way I think about that probably is in terms of the sort of personality traits that would be common. So for someone who would identify as an entrepreneur, then the kind of personality traits they're likely to have would be that, that just persistence beyond what most people can tolerate, that absolute tenacity and belief and the fact that, yeah, like I said before, the, the, 
what they're wanting to see done can't currently be done and part of their job is to bring that solution into existence. I think those would all be kind of characteristics of people who would be identified clearly in the entrepreneur camp, you know, whereas people who are perhaps would identify more clearly in the leadership camp, you know, I think it is much more about, you know, okay, we we know where we need to get to, but getting there, that's it's the journey and the kind of, you know, everything that this entire organization has to do to get there and organizations only function with really strong leadership. Um, whereas, you know, perhaps a large part of entrepreneurship, you know, has a lot much larger kind of individual contributor um, element to it. But like we were saying before, I think, you know, I love Venn diagrams and I think the Venn diagram overlaps. You know, there are people who were largely leaders, um, people who are largely entrepreneurs, but, you know, in both camps, I think the pe people who deliver amazing results probably are, are in the intersection there. And that's, that's a brilliant response to um, entrepreneur capability. So, Sarah, do you, have, do you have a view there? Yeah, I largely agree. Both, I think, are mindsets, that entrepreneurship is a mindset and, and leadership is a mindset, but the stage of the journey can be quite different. And in entrepreneurship, you're often going from zero to one or something that doesn't exist to making it exist. And you're often having to pull more of that weight yourself. And so rolling your sleeves up and getting stuck into it and figuring out a lot of the problems yourself, whereas leadership often has a, an element of being that servant or removing the blockers from others. Uh, and so sometimes that can be the, the difference. Um, but both of them ultimately are more of a mindset than any kind of, you know, job title or um, anything that's bestowed uh, upon you, I, I think. Sure. Um, let, let me um, move to something uh, a lot more positive here is uh, measures of success. So I'll start with you, Sarah. What, what does success look like for you as an entrepreneur? <laughs> I, I was hoping you were going to ask me about um, how we measure it of others, because that was probably going to be easier and, and require less introspection. Um, <laughs> no, I, I, I'm, most, I'm, I'm mostly joking. Look, success for us um, a, a, as a company and, and therefore um, me as, as an entrepreneur and leader is um, about growing the value of, of our portfolio of businesses because uh, we've oriented them towards having an impact. And what that looks like for us is transitioning agriculture to carbon neutral and climate change resilient. And so everything we do is really in service of innovations, technologies, new business models that can be adopted and can have that impact. And so it's a big lofty goal that may sound naive or aspirational, but truly is what gets me up every morning and, and you know, working late hours and rolling up sleeves to do all those things is how much can we move the needle on the, the future of agriculture towards carbon neutral and, and climate change resilient and getting the people and, and entrepreneurs and new business models and ways of thinking aligned to, to making that change in the world. Excellent. Excellent. Matthew? Yeah, like I, I, mean, I think success uh, it's funny right having having you know they talk about being on both sides of the table is, is a phrase when you know a founder versus an investor um and i i find myself in that position now of sitting across the table from from entrepreneurs whose journeys i really recognize and whose challenges and uh excitement i you know strongly resonates with me so i think um, yeah, success in the enterprise that we're currently in is in playing some small part in unlocking all of that fabulous potential. Uh, as Sarah said, you know, the, the area we're interested in unleashing that potential is specifically around, you know, these enormous challenges we have uh, around kind of sustainably scaling up the food system to, to keep up with population growth. But I think the, you know, yeah, success for me is somewhat vicarious. Like when when we can have an intervention and one uh, when what we can do can create or help create, be part of the creation of other successful companies that are out there in the world doing amazing stuff. Yeah, can't can't imagine anything better. One final theme I'd like to talk to you both about, and that's the the nature versus nurture question. So I'll start with Sarah. Are entrepreneurs born or made? I would say made, you know, my 
personal journey and, and influence notwithstanding of, of my parents and, and where I grew up and all the things that looking back for sure had an impact, but I didn't know they would at the time. Um, but, but they're made, I mean, you, we work with entrepreneurs all the time who, if you looked at them on paper or, or background, um, you know, wouldn't tick the traditional boxes, whatever that means of, of being an entrepreneur, but have just believed that something needs to exist in the world and, figured out ways to run through walls and keep, you know, knocking stuff over until they, you know, make the change they want to see in the world. And, um, that's, you just, we just see it every day, people making themselves into entrepreneurs and, and growing into it and learning. And probably the, you know, the best part of what we do is, is seeing people go on that journey. So, um, have, have day in and day out evidence that, um, in my view, they're, they're made and they, you, you make them yourself, you know, not something that someone can make you want into, you can get support along the way, you know, mentorship, et cetera, but um, entrepreneurs often make make themselves. Excellent. Um, Matthew? Yeah, to- totally agree. I think we, we talked before about, you know, the idea of, of kind of capabilities and j- just like in lots of pursuits, you know, there are people who are born with natural talents and attributes um, that might mean part of the entrepreneurial journey is easier for them or part of the entrepreneurial journey, journey is harder for them. I mean, just the idea of being, you know, a bit more extroverted or a bit more introverted is, is one of the things that gets talked a lot uh, about in, in, in kind of entre- entrepreneurial space. But I think, yeah, what it boils down to is it's a vocation. And we don't really, in schools, teach kids about the vocation of being an entrepreneur. I, I was looking at a, someone published a diagram of all the possible jobs in, in agriculture and entrepreneur didn't appear there. It's like, well, actually, strangely enough, nor did farm owner. Um, and it, one thing we see a lot, actually, is there's very strong analogies, really, between farm owners and, and entrepreneurs in, in that regard. So the characteristics, the high tolerance of risk, the self-belief, the self-determination, those are all common characteristics. But I think that it is a shame that we don't promote, you know, being on an entrepreneur as a you know a job that you can have when when you're a kid and something that you could think about um because it's you know i mean yes you need skills and sure you're going to launch a business in a particular area so there will be particular scientific or engineering or whatever disciplines that become important but uh, yeah i think it's it's definitely stuff that you can learn and, and there is also a lot of science to it right when we actually talk about the journey of being an entrepreneur the kind of entrepreneurial science and hypothesis testing and all that kind of stuff that comes along with it there is discipline as well so uh, it'd also be good to see it sort of promoted more in earlier stages uh, of, of education the term entrepreneur in australia was a little bit had a little bit of uh, baggage to it because of some high profile entrepreneurs that did some bad things in the past in australia we know who those gentlemen or ladies might be and i don't need to mention their names on the podcast but Enough to say that it's, it's a loaded term in Australia, but if you talk to entrepreneurs in the US, it's like it's in the DNA. It's, it's almost, um, you, you can't be an American. And I'm Sarah, I'm not trying to generalise too much here, but from the Americans that I spoke to on the podcast, uh, you know, being an entrepreneur should be in your DNA. And I'm wondering why that culture is so different in Australia. Do you, do you have a view, Sarah, given that, that you... You're not, you know, you've come to Australia from the US, is that correct? Yeah, that's right. And you definitely see and have I've sensed and, and seen the difference in that kind of culture. And, you know, even um, seeing young people talk about joining a startup or starting their own business and the reaction they get from their parents. So, oh no, just, you know, join, join one of the big companies and you know, just a bit more of that social pressure to um, go the safer route versus in the U.S., you can almost go too far the other way where it's so highly romanticized and often so highly caught up in, you know, raise a bunch of money and scale and grow at all costs that you lose. I think in both narratives, the reality, which is it's a lot of hard work and it's really hard, um, but it can be really rewarding. Um, So I don't know that either culture ends up coming out on top. The thing you have in, in the U S is just more social acceptance around it and more recognition that it is a, a path and more support. So one thing we see a lot in the U S is just the, 
ecosystem around entrepreneurs, whether that's materials for how to do it, it being taught in, in you know, colleges and universities, uh, accelerator and incubator programs, you know, angel networks, there's a lot more supporting infrastructure for entrepreneurs than there used to be in Australia. That's changing a lot now uh, and, and really with some positive impacts on helping people who otherwise might not have taken that leap to start businesses in Australia. Um, but it does, you know, there are cultural elements of it as well. And that risk tolerance, you know, the American dream, anyone can make it uh, for sure is, is present uh, in the US in a way that it's not here. Matthew, your, your view? Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's something that's, it's, it's changing over time. Like Sarah was just talking about risk reward. And I think in earlier times in Australia, both were quite narrow. There was you know, not a lot of tolerance for risk, but the upside often was pretty capped as well. And the people who were taking big risks perhaps weren't being entirely honest about the risks they were taking. And so when the inevitable happened, you know, that, that might have contributed to the sort of earlier negative connotations of, 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 of the phrase. Sarah also used the word ecosystem, which is, you know, a word we commonly use when we're talking about that sort of support that needs to build up for entrepreneurial activity to be successful. You know, the first company I started, we won a $25,000 contract. We needed to borrow $2,500 to buy a computer. And our bank manager said, yeah, you give me $2,500 to put in a safety deposit and I'll lend you $2,500 to buy the computer, right? So, so the point of the story is that that's, that's an indicator of the sort of ecosystem that wasn't there at the time, right? Whereas today, you could go into an incubator program and they, you know, all the things you need would be there. Getting your hands on five or $10,000 through a number of different means is very achievable. And so you can afford to take more risk because the ecosystem and the support is there. I, I think it's a really positive thing. You know, we are shifting our frame to sort of understand that more risk is acceptable, um, but, but the rewards can be greater as well. And I think that's just something that progresses over time. And, yeah, sometimes it overcorrects. You know, there have been times in Silicon Valley where it overcorrected badly and people's expectations of returns just got completely out of whack and what they funded was silly. Um, and then it sort of pulls back. And I think it, you know, generally finds an even an even point. I think the place it's heading in Australia is, is, is largely very positive and certainly much better than a decade before or, or certainly the decade before. And does that, does that um, uh, the creation of those ecosystems and incubators and, and systems to help um, entrepreneurs, help, th uh, help them on their road to success, whether they're established or emerging entrepreneurs, is that something that necessarily needs to come from government or need to come from the private sector or a combination of the two? Yeah, I think the role we often kind of slice it in two ways. One is helping increase the birth rate of startups. So getting more people to start companies than otherwise would. And the second is increasing the survival rate of companies and their interventions in, in both places. The caveat we would give is you don't want to be filling the valley of death because that tends to exist for a reason. And so striking that balance of enabling the infrastructure and often investing in the qualitative squishy stuff like community and networks and all of that is a lot more important than the physical infrastructure. Um, but sometimes governments can end up on the wrong side of that. That's uh, that's quite a trippy response that we, you need the valley of death there and it's there for a reason. And I, I get why you say that and I guess sometimes some businesses need to die a natural death because for whatever reason they're not going to work and uh, the cycle needs to start again it's, it's quite a agile mindset to have that sometimes things will work and sometimes they won't but also it gets back to the reality that sometimes an idea won't work or a business sees its natural progression end and something else has to start what, what's what's your perspective on that Matthew? Well, I think it goes down to, you know, whether you should be in the business of knowing whether an idea is likely to work or not and what, what the appropriate role of government would be. I mean, the, the shorthand way of saying it is build racetracks, don't back winners. Um, and that's, that's generally a principle that plays out pretty well when you're thinking about the role of government and, and entrepreneurial ecosystems. You know, venture. So people talk about, we've used the phrase a couple of times now, VC or venture capital. And 
the point of that is that it's actually a matched pair with entrepreneurs and it's the kind of capital that is kind of familiar with all of the paradigms in, in the entrepreneurial space and it's, you know, it's risk capital to, risk, to match risky activity. Um, now, you know, so you could say, well, maybe, I mean, this, yeah, it gets complicated because there's ways that you can still stimulate things like funds and you can make it more likely that investors will come here and set up funds. But all those things, yeah, as long as they fall more into the building gyms and racetracks category and, and not, you know, picking individual winners, then they tend to be good interventions because they're and, and often if it's like remove a blocker and eventually the system will start to function on its own those would be the sort of defining characteristics that we want to see when you start to think about you know what should government be doing to build up the entrepreneurial ecosystem well, there's a nice message for those in the government space listening to this podcast um build it and they will come so <laughs> uh look Thank you again for your time, uh, Sarah and Matthew. I know you're busy. And um, for those listening, this has been uh, Talking Leadership with your podcast host, Eric Perez. I thank you again for joining me. Uh, Sarah and Matthew, thanks very much. No worries, Eric. Thanks for having us. No worries. And for those listening, I'll catch you all on the next podcast.